like this before, purely because of the fitness and the diet. Uh, everything I did uh, throughout my career was wrong. And I'm in my late 30s now, and all of a sudden I'm starting to do things right. And I hark back to days of when uh, I rode horses with wasting. I, I remember one day when I was on the farm, I had a couple of rides for Bart Cummings in Brisbane through the carnival. and. I got in a bit of a session with some cattle buyers on the Thursday or something before and I know I was 57 stripped on the Friday night and when I got to the races on the Saturday morning I was 51 and a half. I rode the two winners but I died for the next couple of weeks so they were the things that I, you know, that you, you did the wrong thing and uh, there was too much fluctuation. I could be 51 Saturday, Monday 57. With the encouragement of an old friend, Sydney trainer Les Bridge, Olsen started to shed the kilos and the pair quietly hatched a plan to be at Flemington on the first Tuesday of November. Bridge had a horse that at the time was moderately performed by anyone's standings. But his astute assessment of Ken's eye was duly justified a few months later when Larry Olsen jumped aboard the chestnut gelding and took his place in the 1987 Melbourne Cup. Oh, there's one rearing high out wide, Belciano. They're racing. Belciano jumped well. As we jumped the out and we come up the straight, there's a lot of jostling going on. And uh, the sooner you can get yourself well. comfortable, settled, the better. And I fell in, I fell into about seventh or eighth place, back on the fence. She's in front of me, and I'm following her. And whatever happens there, like they were coming in, bouncing off her, they couldn't move her. But I kept following her. He's got his head right up her backside, you know, out the straight the first time, over the crossing, and everything sort of settles down a little bit there. And then as, as you get up to the mile, for some reason, the pace starts to increase. You know, there's, yep. there's a lot of, you know, it's just mind over things, you know. But I've got him tucked away. And I thought, I'm going to wait and wait and wait with him. As we get up to the 1200, six furlong, the pace quickens a bit more. You, you, you hear it, you feel it, you know? As we got to the half mile, it's starting to get a little bit serious now, and those that are sort of uh, on the inside of wanting to get out, and those that are out, they're going to they're hold them back in, and there's a fair bit of jostling going on, and the pace is motoring. 600, really starting to hum, you know? Too far, too far out, really, to be doing that. And at that time, I had Empire Rose and Rosedale in front of me, and they start, and he's it. They've eased out, and they were able to get into it, and they went forward. And I thought, well, if I did that at that stage, I'm going too soon. I preferred to stay back on the fence. I was back on the fence behind. As we come to the turn, they're moving into the race beautifully, you know. And next thing, I'm, there was a line of about six horses in front of me, and I thought, well, I've. Oh, I've blown this, you know, this is just blown, oh, here I am, yeah, I've got this great wall in front of me. And then right in front of me was Darren Beedman on a horse called Scarbilla. And as we straightened, he started to leave the fence. And, well, he's left this run for me. And as Ken's eyes seen the run, he's wanting to get into it a bit quicker, you know, and he's starting to overlap himself a bit. I've got him holding up and I uh, sort of heard the crowd the noise, you know, and, and I'm starting to push him along, push him along, and I give him a hit with the whip, the left hand, and he, woof. as soon as I hit him with the whip, he just went, one, you know, give me a neck, and I heard the crowd, and I thought, they, they see Empire Rose and Rose down there, so he's coming through, and I hit him again, and give me another neck, he's about a length behind, or a length and a half behind, but every time I hit him with the whip, he kept giving me that, that neck, hit him again and give that neck and then I caught him and then I hit him again and he drove his neck in front and by the time we hit the line I was about a neck in front or something like that but he was a spent force you know he really was he won, he won the race and uh, but it wasn't until about oh, 50 yards after the post that you it dawns on you <laughs> you've won this damn race you know it has been somewhat of a personal triumph for myself because I I have had to lose a lot of weight um, to achieve what I have, but uh, it makes it all worthwhile. Something I never ever dreamt I could do, achievement-wise, uh, it's, the, it's the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. I've done some good things, I suppose, or things I can always be proud about. But the Melbourne Cup always will be 
the recognition right throughout the world. Wherever I travelled after, people know about it. People, you know, oh, that, that, even today, even for what I do, uh, you've won a Melbourne Cup. It just means so much. Another former champion, although of the equine variety, savouring the delights of retirement, is the horse that captivated racing crowds Australia-wide through sheer determination, Bo Rogue. Which he is, that's the best he's walked for ages. Oh, yeah. Uh, he said, better and best off leaving alone. That's right. Until the hook grows down a bit more. Well, I rode him a few times in, in jump outs and that one. Uh, Vic was having a bit of trouble getting him to, to come out of the gates and get going, so... Uh, no, nothing impressive to, to begin with, but uh, got him going a little bit and I wasn't overly impressed, but uh, Jeff, Jeff had the stopwatch and I didn't and uh, they, they were better judges than me on that particular day. I remember one day Andrew Slack, the great international, came to work at Channel 9 and we had an afternoon off. I said, oh, I've got to go down and see Vo Rogue. And he said, oh, can I come and see Vo Rogue? I said, yeah. So we went down to the stable and the doors were open. There was no one home. And there he was. just, And I said, there he is there. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's Vo Rogue, that's him there. He said, but we could, we could do a Shergar. We could put a lead on him and put him in a float and take him away and kidnap him. I said, yeah. I said, that's him there. He said, there's no one here. I said, no, there's nobody here. But, but the funny part about it was, that I think if anyone came along and looked at him, they would want him. Yeah, where's the real hood? I mean, that bloke. Well, that was Vo Rogue. With his unfashionable but equally astute trainer Vic Rail in his corner, Bo Rogue travelled Australia, mostly barefoot, racing and beating the best horses of his generation, breaking the will of his opposition by getting out in front and running away to win, endearing himself to all that saw him, particularly in Melbourne. But Bo Rogue has a good break. Bo Rogue will win his third. Bo Rogue scores again. Jeff rang me and said, you know, when can you get down here? And I said, oh, probably on the, on the Saturday after the, the um, Australia Cup meeting and he said oh well uh, there's a few jockeys ringing up so I said well you better pick me up at the airport I'll be ready so we got there on uh, Australia Cup day and he ran eight seconds faster than Bone Crush on the same day. Going by the 400. From that day small forward, Small partnered Bo Rogue in 62 of his remaining 63 starts, with six being at Group 1 level, including two Australian Cups and wins in every state capital except Tasmania. And Bo Rogue is going great guns. He's more than two and a half lengths in front over superimposed and then our poetic prince. And Bo Rogue is going to lead all the way again. A great performance in the Australian Cup. They're like... Um, you know, but Abbott and Lou Costello, they were just a team and they knew each other and the horse, and the horse ran for him. Vicky Rail trained him, the horse didn't wear shoes, he left him in the rain, and didn't do this, didn't do that. There was always a story floating around that some of the bigger name trainers were, were going to try and, and, and get him, to train him, because they used to look at what Vic Rail used to do and I couldn't understand how this horse could do that. And then one top trainer said to me, because I asked him, I said, oh, is it true that Vaux Rogue might be lost um, to another stable? And I don't know whether his owner, Mr Perry, would have, would have transferred him anyway. But this top trainer said, no, he said, he won't go anywhere. I said, why is that? He said, because if he does go somewhere else and he doesn't like the way he's been trained, he fails. You're ruined for life. Your reputation's ruined for life. So he said, they won't touch him. They'll, they'll just leave him where he is. No, he's very versatile. I won a, I think it was a thousand and ten metre race on him at Doomben. He came from 15 or 16 lengths off him at the 600. Uh, that was an open class race, so he was a phenomenal horse. Took Vic Rail, unfashionable trainer, and Cyril Small, with respect to Cyril, unfashionable jockey, but took him on this magical ride all over Australia, from Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, and they, they won every, well, almost everything they contested. Scalacci's in front, joined by Barossa Boy. Barossa Boy's hit the lead. Look at Rough Habit. Rough Habit's flying on the rails. Rough Habit moved up, grabbed the lead, and he's won the straight race. The Brisbane weather during the winter racing carnival is in stark contrast to the climate our colleagues across the Tasman experience. But for years, the locals have welcomed the New Zealanders back with open arms. Some more than others. Oh, I thought I was equal to the nine. <laughs> <laughs> Likeable larrikin Kiwi trainer John Wheeler first seized on the opportunity in 1990, when he sent a team of horses to Brisbane to chase some of the rich winter carnival bounty. 
Oh, it's just a good place to come. It doesn't clash with any other carnivals in Australia or New Zealand, and uh, it's just a good place to spend winter. It makes the winters a bit shorter at home because we get probably four or five months of pretty average weather. Look, I've got no doubt that the Queensland Winter Racing Carnival would not be what it was if it wasn't for the Kiwi invasion every year. I mean, they, you know, it's fantastic. And the Sydney trainers, you know, um, you know, Bart Cummings, Gay Waterhouse, you know, Danny O'Brien, Lee Friedman, David Hayes from Melbourne. But I think it's the Kiwis that really had that touch of spice. And they bring a bit of the unknown. I mean, people are always looking for ruffian racing and, you know, you see these Kiwi horses come out of the, you know, come from the southern land and uh, no one quite knows much about them and all of a sudden they'll arrive at some, um, you know, good old price and uh, the Kiwis have back, backed it off the map. Shocking going to with every stride and Cordrilla, Cordrilla in the rough habit colours coming through at the middle. Cordrilla takes the lead. It's Cordrilla for a derby victory. Cordrilla first, shocking second, third Larry's never made all. Among his team was a nondescript bay gelding who, to the naked eye, looked anything but a future champion racehorse. But the astute wheeler knew better, and his judgment was proven spot on when Rough Habit burst onto the scene to score a gutsy win in the 1990 QTC derby. Although he had identified Rough Habit as one of the best gallopers in his care, even Wheeler did not predict the horse would return to Brisbane for the next four years and make the Winter Carnival his own. Left to go. Rough Habit drew away from Ray's Hope. He's a length in front of Ray's Hope Castle down into third place. It's going to be an old Kiwi finish and Rough Habit's going to win the derby. Rough Habit first, Ray's Hope. Oh, well, the first memory he was, um, he was sent to my place and arrived about midnight and uh, I'd never seen the horse and I knew the owner and she said to me, he's just a nice horse. When he got off the float, he was a pretty ordinary looking horse, very plain. And I rang her up the next morning, I said to her, do you want me to make a silk purse out for sow's ear? But from that day on, it, it wasn't long before I thought, this horse has got something. I never expected him to go where he went, but uh, every gallop, he always went well, he did it easily. He was a horse that could do things that most horses couldn't do. And that's why they're champions. Um, he could. He won from 1,200 to a mile and a half. He won the Derby here at a mile and a half. He won. He won a, two straight breaks at seven furlongs, and he won three Doomben Cups at ten furlongs. So he was very versatile. He was. The wetter it got, the better he got. He, he won on top of the ground. With his regular jockey and fellow Kiwi Jim Cassidy in the pigskin, Rough Habit achieved what even his most loyal fans thought unlikely and went on to rewrite the record books by winning an astonishing three Doombin Cups in 91, 92 and 93 and two Stradbroke handicaps in 91 and 92. Rough Habit was a street fighter with an affinity for a wet track and his second Stradbroke win and the ensuing euphoria stands out like a beacon in the memory of both Cassidy and Wheeler. The second Stradbroke was amazing because everyone had written him off and uh, mainly because of the weight. He was top weight in the race, 59 kgs, drew badly. I said to Jay Cassidy, who rode him pretty much all the time up here, I said to him, just drop him out and uh, if you have a, you'll have to ride him for luck. You won't be able to go around them today because he's just got too much weight, too much against them. Well, funny enough, me and Johnny Wheeler, I think we spoke at the Stradbroke luncheon prior to that Stradbroke that year. And as they do it, at the luncheons, they always ask the jockey for a tip, and I remember standing there as cocky as ever, saying, whatever beats Rough Habit will win the Stradbroke. They said, but he's got 58 and a half, he's trying to win back-to-back -back Stradbrokes. Uh, can't do it, he's doing 20 alley. I said, well, be there tomorrow to see something special, and uh, I went back to last on him. I think I was still last on the corner. He was going to pull him to the outside, I think, and um, the horse decided he was going to go through them, so he weaved his way through them, and... Jimmy didn't have much say really, it was just the way it was and uh, everything opened up for him as he was going through and uh, grabbed him short of the line and went away to win by half a or something. He's looming as a big danger, Scalacci's in front joined by Barossa Boy, Barossa Boy's hit the lead, look at Rough Habit, Rough Habit's flying on the rails, Rough Habit moved up, grabbed the lead and he's won the straight broke. Oh, it was, it was electric, it was unbelievable after he won that second uh, straight broke here because he was a pin-up horse for the for the Brisbane public, and he was he was my champion and Johnny Wheeler's champion. And uh, horses like that are great for racing, and he's been great for Queensland racing. And it's continued the association with Johnny Wheeler, and probably obviously me coming back to ride here every carnival. Um, 
special memories and great great for racing. Show. Waikika Mukau looks to be picking up his ground all right in front of Darja. Air Seattle's never been on the track. However, if the Sunshine State's adoption of Rough Habit was still under consideration, the horse rubber stamped at Eagle Farm during the winter of 1995. His final career victory in the O'Shea Stakes for Brisbane jockey Shane Scriven as a battle-scarred eight-year-old under a big weight brought tears to dry eyes and prompt the QTC to name the public bar in the little champion's honour. He's got them, the great horse. Rough Habit race to the lead, 100 to go. A champion rider, a champion horse. He bolts in Rough Habit. He's winning the O'Shea Stakes. That's probably about as nearly as exciting I've ever gotten a race. I think it was supposed to be his last start in a race. Shane Scriven rode him. It was 20 runners. It was in the dark. It was pitch black. And he was last. And he, he ran them all up. And he, and he killed them in the straight. The greatest emotional race for me was uh, his last, what was then his last win in his career, the O'Shea Stakes with Shane Scriven on him. This particular day, Colin Olsen said to me he was going to lead, and there's a couple other leaders in the race, and I was really confident, and uh, there was a lot of speed in the race, and he just blew them away, he won easily. And it was just the reception, you know, he'd been here many a year, um, had a great following. He was out of form at the time, and when he won, the, uh, the crowd just went ballistic. Wayne Wilson said to the crowd, we've got to stand and give this horse an ovation, and uh, everyone in the cr crowd stood up and clapped, and that was really emotional, you know, that everyone was so supportive. One of the great moments of Queensland racing, Ruffy has won the O'Shea Stakes. They reckon they've never seen a reception like it since Tullick won the Cup. So, yeah, it means a lot. They've named a bar after him, yeah. Obviously a great horse. Uh, there's a certain horse just seem to have the will to win, I've noticed. You know, they, they just, it uh, doesn't matter where they're placed in running. Um, they just seem to know where that finishing line is and they want to be there first. While Rough Habit was as effective at Eagle Farm as he was at Doombin, another freakish locally trained galloper had a lasting love affair with the track he wasn't trained on. From the day he was broken in, Chief De Beers was trained by Bill Calder at Eagle Farm, but he remained a maiden on his home track until the day he retired, some 50 starts and 20 wins later. I think it's a bit of a furphy saying he couldn't handle Eagle Farm because he was placed in some great races over there. Maybe he just didn't have the right opportunity and things fell into place here at Durban. But you'd be foolish to say he wasn't a better horse at Durban than at any other track. But he, he's, he was a great horse, Chief De Beers, and, and he, he could adapt to different distances from a thousand metres up to a mile. He won two legs of the Triple Crown here at Durban twice, but couldn't put the three together in one year. But he won every leg of the Triple Crown over a two year period. He's got the race one, I'd say. He's two and a half all our mob. Then cohort so keen, excellent bulldog Yates, but it's all Chief De Beers. He's annihilating them in the 10,000. And Chief De Beers went home to win brilliantly. All our mob is second, third cohort. Then came Gold The Chief Cup notched C, Group 1 wins in the 1995 and 1998 Doombin 10,000 and the Group 1 BTC Cup. But the mountain of memories he left for his legions of fans were devoid of any Eagle Farm glory as such. The remarkable fact remains unsolved, but there's plenty of good judges who believe Chief De Beers was decidedly unlucky not to have rectified the record books before he retired to join the Queensland Mounted Police in 1999. Does the Chief still think he's a racehorse when he gets out in the parade? Some days he does. Um, he likes to be in front at all times, that's which is why he's in front of the parade today. I can't put a logical answer to it. You can put an answer that, oh, you know, the trat straight was too long and this was that and this was that. But when I watched his races and called his races there a number of times, I just have no logical explanation as to why he didn't. I just think it's one of those you know, mysteries of life. It was a scene that has shocked the racing community. Ten racehorses have died suddenly since Monday. Nine at Vic Rail's Hendra Stables, another at a neighbouring stable. It's just devastating to see the horses, the way they've died and what's happened to them. 
In September 1994, nearly 15 years before equine influenza crippled the Australian racing industry, Brisbane racing was brought to its knees by a disease which years later remains incurable. The Hendra virus, as it is now known, first gained national headlines when it swept through the stables formerly occupied by the champion Vaux Rogue and eventually claimed the life of the great horse's trainer, Vic Rail. Lisa, Vic's girlfriend at the time, or partner at the time, uh, rang me in the morning, it was a Tuesday, and uh, asked me to come because they had a few sick horses there. And uh, when I got to the stables, uh, went round and examined them, we, out of a population of about 23 horses, we had uh, half of those were sick. There was a lot of unknown about this. It was, it, it was scary. Uh, horses as we understood it, or at least as Ray understood it at the time, were uh, hemorrhaging enormously and, and, and simply passing away and um, they died very painful deaths and at the end of the conversation it was agreed that before anyone attended the scene that we needed a bit more information um, probably a wise move in the in the circumstances. I took blood samples out of some of those horses and took the blood samples out over to the pathology laboratory in Brisbane spoke to the pathologist over there to see if there's anything um, that they were dealing with currently in other horses around, around the place, um, which there wasn't. The Department of Primary Industries has quarantined the stables and is conducting tests. Experts say the horses died of an acute lung disease similar to one known as African horse sickness and it's feared other horses may be at risk. Seven horses that died in less than 12 hours or are euthanised in less than 12 hours. So that's, that's uh, you know, when you see big uh, 500 kilo horses actually uh, collapsing on you and staggering, it's, uh, it's a very dramatic scene. And uh, so I was there sort of day and night right through that whole period uh, in that week, uh, trying, to, trying to help them and trying to treat them the best way I could, trying to get answers. No one could give answers and uh, just trying to manage it the best way I could. Australia's racing industry hasn't seen anything like it since an outbreak of botulism killed 30 Sydney horses in April. Experts probing this case have ruled out countless diseases and poisons. They say this could even be a new disease. Even if a, a virus is isolated, uh, uh, that's not sufficient to say that that is the virus that's caused the problem. Actually, it was like something dropped out of the sky onto the place. It really, that's sort of, you know, when you think back of it, that's... We couldn't sort of, even after you know days and days and days of sort of looking for, looking for what caused it, no one could come up with an answer. And uh, it wasn't really until um, oh well over 12 months before the bats actually were identified as being the cause. While his horses perished and bled to death in their stables, Vic Rail also lost his battle for life after trying to save one of his beloved animals a few days earlier. 49-year-old Vic Rail lost his fight for life this morning. He'd been battling lung and kidney problems and died from a heart attack. Doctors have revealed Vic Rail had an illness which resembled Legionnaire's disease. They say a possible link with the horse's illness is most unlikely but hasn't been excluded. There was sufficient similarity for uh, that possibility still to be open until we can get uh, confirming laboratory tests back. Really loved his horses, that's all he virtually lived for. Very well liked and he had a lot of good horses, had a lot of luck. And I think he'll be sincerely missed in racing. When they did the autopsy on him and looked at the samples afterwards, uh, after they'd identified the, and this was, you know, a year or so later, after they'd identified the fact that uh, uh, the virus was actually transmitted by the bats and, and, and wasn't until really another person had died, uh, a gentleman called Mark Preston had died 13 months after he got sick, he died in October 1995. But when they went back and did the uh, staining of the tissues from the autopsy and they found evidence on staining and uh, that there were actually evidence of the virus actually still present in the tissues. In the ensuing years, there have been several more deadly outbreaks of the killer disease across Queensland and vets, government bodies and industry officials are still grappling to find a cure. 
One of the major recommendations is that we spend all the, uh, the focus be given to the uh, prioritisation for a vaccine for horses because if you can vaccinate the horses, therefore you'll get uh, protection for the horses and then you'll protect the people as well. A vaccine for, for people is just not, a, not an issue, it won't, won't, won't occur. But the big dollars have got to be spent uh, and a vaccine for horses must, must be uh, forthcoming. Some say money earned is sweeter than money won. But for Queensland's newest national training sensation, Peter Moody, it's probably a combination of both. Moody began his long haul to national acclaim his parents' property, a little town called Wyandra, which sits halfway between Charleville and Cunnamulla. The big bloke learned to ride almost before he could walk, and as soon as he was old enough, he headed off to Sydney in pursuit of his dreams become a champion horse trainer. It was hard. I, I, I believe I cost myself a lot of my childhood, my teenage years, uh, in what I did. You know, getting out of bed and going to work at 2.30 in the morning is not the norm for a 16-year-old boy that had just lobbed in a big city like Sydney. It used to hurt seeing blokes, you know, even when I got up to 17 or 18, seeing my mates get to the pub and having all the fun. And, and I used to think, what the bloody hell am I doing this for? But now I'm... Uh, forever grateful that I, I did, you know, towed the line and did the right thing, you know. Despite the limited social life, Moody's determination never wavered. In stints working for Tommy Smith at Randwick, only flamed his burning desire. His first break came when former successful Sydney trainer Bill Mitchell offered Moody the chance to return to Queensland to begin a training partnership. We were sort of a little bit of trailblazing, if you like. We actually applied for training partnership back then. Uh, which uh, wasn't allowed at the time, but we tried and we were refused. But all was not lost, and unbeknown to him, Moody was just months away from unearthing one of the best printers ever produced in Queensland. A horse like General Ladean was a freak, and the owner actually went to Crown Lodge, which was uh, John Hawkes' stables at the time, one Sunday and couldn't find anyone and just happened to be driving down our road and I was mowing the lawn on a Sunday afternoon. A and he knew me and pulled up, introduced himself and asked if I'd be interested in training a horse. Uh, and that very horse ended up being General Ladean. General Ladean in front of the 200, Chief De Beers in second spot, followed by Spendon, huge jet, but it's all General Ladean with 100 metres left to go. Chief De Beers, Spendon, pleasure giver next, but it's the General, he's back on his pedestal today, General Ladean, and he won the money, second home. He was a freakish horse, and uh, he, he sort of took me all over Australia. Um, he had unbelievable ability and in his time in our care, uh, being Bill and myself, I think he won 12 from 16 races, he won a Magic Millions. I thought he was unlucky to be beaten a Golden Slipper, he won a Newmarket Handicap, the Lightning Stakes uh, and numerous other races along the way and, and that horse was probably as big a part of my career as anything because he took me around Australia and met all the right people, the influential people that are now the backbone of my stable to this day. General Nadim left them standing and look at him go home. General Nadim is racing away and he brilliantly wins the San Domenico Stakes. Sports got second, Addy win third, close up encounter and pleasure given. In 1998, Mitchell and Moody parted ways peacefully and the boy from Wyandra wasted no time in establishing a quality string of horses at Eagle Farm from where the winners flowed freely. Three or four days after my licence was granted, I had my first runner at Caloundra. Uh, it was a filly called Resolute Lass, I remember it well, and she got beat a short half head in a, in a race there at Caloundra, uh, ridden by my apprentice at the time, Cecily Eaton, and unfortunately she dropped the whip with about 50 yards to go and we got beaten a lip, and I thought, crikey. <laughs> But uh, we didn't have to wait long. I think it was Boxing Day the same year. We won our uh, first race at Eagle Farm with a little horse called Ebony Way. Ebony Way's kicked on the rails at the 200. Ebony Way is just in front of Gaussing and Thong and Pushbike. They're clear of Island Time. Ebony Way's got a real kick in him. He drew away from Gaussing again. And Ebony Way is drawing away in the run to the nine to score easily. Ebony Way first, Gaussing second. You know, I think since that uh, December 98, we've the stables had something like 13 or 1400 winners uh, Australia wide and uh, you know it's been a ride that I never dreamed to be possible but uh, it's been a great ride and hopefully it can continue for a while yet. Bigger things beckoned and Moody took a huge gamble when he turned his back on Brisbane and relocated his wife and young family to Melbourne a few years later. Fortune favours the brave and Moody was the toast of Australian racing when he trained Amalfi to win the 2001 VRC Derby. 
and big race winners have been breezing past winning posts across Australia in Moody's blue and white colours ever since. Amalfi and Zarek fighting out the race. Amalfi the outside, Zarek, they hit the line. Photo finish. Maybe Amalfi in a desperately close go just behind them. And they're racing. He but there's okay one special today. victory that remains sweeter than all, okay, and, so and that was his games. win for one of when his favourite owners Australia, on his home turf in the 2007 Durban down. Cup. Cheekway Chetto and Gaze led, and there's Desert War striding up three deep at the line the first time. Probably the most sentimental one was a mare called Cinque Sano. She won the Durban Cup um, for terrific clients of mine, Stuart and Trish Ramsey and their family. Uh, they're in northern New South Wales, and um, all the kids went to school on the Gold Coast, and they hold a house there, and it was. Well, I think it was 10 days previous to her winning the Dooman Cup that they'd lost uh, one of their daughters, 18 year old and uh, fit and healthy and in the prime of her life and it was a very trying time and for that horse to come out and win the Dooman Cup 10 days later that was uh, probably the most, uh, I wouldn't say enjoyable but it was the most fulfilling thing that I'd ever done with a horse, win that race for that family that day and they've probably been my biggest supporters ever since the day I started training and we've had a lot of luck and won group ones with mares like Ancient Song and Guy Cuddle, so they've been terrific supporters of the stable, and to win that race for them meant, meant a lot. Cheekway Chetto, the leader with 100 metres to go. Gaze on the outsides coming after Cheekway Chetto, Penathon late, but it's Cheekway Chetto in front, and Cheekway Chetto's beaten Gaze and Penathon in the Doomben Cup. Nearly two decades after Strawberry Road showed the world what Queensland racehorses are made of, the champion Galloper's main sidekick emerged from his father's shadow and ordered a passport for one of his horses. Dan Bagore rode Strawberry Road track work throughout his Australian career, but a tidy little bay colt named Falvalon would be the horse to really put the young trainer's name up in lights. It was one Sunday afternoon and a couple of owners walked into the yard. One I knew which was uh, uh, sort of friend of a family relation so they walked in and said you want to train a horse for us and I said yeah so what's he buy and he said Alan on and I said oh yeah no worries I'll train it like dad always told me don't don't knock young horses back you never know they don't know what they buy so um, yeah he came into the stable and um, and again he wasn't overly big horse he was a nice little horse but he wasn't overly big but um, by geez he had a good motor. To Belville on 100 ago, four lengths in front, Mannington getting up to second and then super elegant and Latois but it's all Belville on the run home, he's cruised in, eased up Belville on by two Mannington. Probably his most exciting race, this is bizarre when you consider what he won in Hong Kong and here his first start in a race. He, he knuckled out of the gates in a field of about 18 over a thousand at Eagle Farm and it came from last and won. That's when, that's when you know they're good. That's when, when the horses do that, you know, like he did. And he not only just got up, he, he, he smothered, he just rounded them up. I remember walking off Eagle Farm that day, I thought, gee, this is, I don't know where this will end up, but this is, this is all right. Falvalon finished his two-year-old season undefeated with four wins from four starts and he continued on his winning way with dominant wins in stakes sprinting races as a three-year-old. But it was as a fully developed stallion in 2000 when Falvalon would stake his claim to real greatness by taking the first of his two scalps of the world's best sprinters in the Hong Kong sprint at Sha Tin with Damien Oliver in the saddle. Falvalon hits the front, Falvalon and more like they hit it a close goal. He returned home to tackle the Winter Carnival and duly scored in the first of his two Doomben 10,000 victories. First one, Michael Carl rode him. Uh, I thought it was probably one of his best wins. He was held up, held up and got out late and just run sp spinning hill down on the line. And um, you know, that was, for me, that was my first group one, so I was pretty proud day as well. Spinning Hill and Falvalon. Falvalon's raced up with Spinning Hill. Falvalon, the little horse, grabbed the lead. He wins the 10,000. Falvalon has beaten Spinning Hill. Third's a photo. In it a but it was in 2001 that Falvalon conquered the world with his second consecutive win at Chartin against the best sprinters in the world. Once more, Ollie on board. Falvalon and Morlock, Morlock dives, Falvalon! Falvalon, what a heady beat, Morlock! What a great race! We knew we had the horse. We just had to make sure he travelled well and settled in. And with Hong Kong, it's something it's, that we never had an afterthought. We just planned for it to go. And um, 
hoped and well, we got the right result which made it even more better. I travelled to Hong Kong for both his international wins there. Very underrated horse, Falvalon. To do what he did, to win two ten thousands here and to win two internationals in Hong Kong against the best sprinters in the world, fantastic performance and now proving to be a very successful stallion at stud. So, great horse. Oh, it's an absolute disaster. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's the worst possible thing that could have happened to us. This undoubtedly is Queensland Racing's darkest hour. There is no racing this afternoon and the program has been cancelled. Australia's reputation for producing world-class gallopers is due in no small part to Queenslanders like Falvalon and Strawberry Road. But although our next champion didn't travel offshore, Gold Edition's resume is undisputably of international standing. More than 30 years after the other great Queensland Grey Gunsend farewelled the crowds, Gold Edition emerged from obscurity to become one of the nation's best ever sprinting mares. Her outstanding racetrack performances cemented a long-standing friendship between her trainer Ron Maund and owner breeders Kevin and Tanith O'Brien and justified their decision to break the budget to secure her at the yearling sales. Tanner said to me discreetly one day, uh, Ron, we can afford to give this a bit of a nudge and Kevin deserves to follow his real passion for horses through. And she said, you see if you can get him a good one. I spent 120,000, I think, on Gold Edition and 110,000 on Pure Energy and um, a range of horses. I did buy a certain type of horse, even though you wouldn't know it looking at them, they were a mixed bag. Uh, Gold Edition was a big wolf head grey thing with heavy bone like a draft horse and Pure Energy was a little fat quarter horse. So, but they had a criteria that met uh, what I thought would make them run and run early. And uh, luckily when we did uh, unzip the wallet, they, uh, the good ones come forward and the yeah, O'Brien's nearly uh, had a lifetime all in a few years of uh, high class racing. Gold Edition had a huge heart and her ability to cope with racing the best sprinters in the land, preparation after preparation, endeared her to racing fans across the nation. At the completion of her arduous two-year-old season, Gold Edition had started 12 times for five wins, including a luckless performance in the Golden Slipper, when she was rated unlucky by many not to have beaten the winner Miss Finland. She returned in a blaze of glory as a three-year-old, winning twice in Brisbane and Sydney, before she ventured south to defeat the Colts with a devastating win in the Group 1 Ascot Vale Stakes at Flemington. Gold Edition a mile in front, she's got the Ascot Vale, she is going to care to home from splashing out, and Gold Edition wins four lengths to splashing out. Well, we were starting to sort of develop a bit of an opinion. She won, I think it was a missile stakes in Sydney, a thousand metre race, and with a fair bit of authority and I thought if I uh, do the right thing here they're bringing this Ascot Vale stakes up to a group one and uh, moving it on the program at Flemington I thought I might be nearly able to this horse might measure up to this and we we didn't know she was the gold edition that we know she was now you know we thought she was just pretty good but when she went there I must admit after she uh, she gave them a short back and sides on the Saturday and then come out on the Thursday and one by seven lengths against the Phillies. All of a sudden I took a bit of a deep breath and I thought, oh, this might be the great horse that I've been looking for. Gold Edition up to the turn, a half in front of Universal Queen. In the next 18 months, Gold Edition started a further 15 times against the best sprinters in the land. And although she only recorded one more Group 1 victory in the 2007 Manicato Stakes at Mooney Valley, she finished runner-up in four Group 1s. It's running on well, but still Gold Edition in front. Universal Queen Ball, Mr. Drawing Hard, the mighty little grey man, Gold Edition. Gold Edition, a half-length of all, Mr. Raffaele. Maund ignored the knockers, who said he had over-raced Gold Edition throughout her illustrious career. And indeed, it was his great knowledge of his champion that brought about the end of her racing days after an unplaced effort behind Apache Cat at Flemington. Gold Edition, what a wonderful filly. You know, as tough as old boots. Uh, Ronnie Maund was criticised on several occasions for the racing program that he set her, but at the end of the day, she said, Chewy on your boot, and she kept on winning those wonderful races. Probably could have been a little bit better, but she was in, a, in an era of, of great champions. Miss Andretti beat her, 
uh, take over Target, beat her here one day. That was a great race here. Take over Target and and Gold Edition fighting out the finish of a of a of a Doombin 10,000. So what a wonderful race that was. She was a fantastic race mare, Gold Edition. Again, not much to look at. She was a skinny little thing, but gee, she could run. Yeah, well, 3.8 million dollars later, I can assure you that Kevin and Tanith O'Brien were pretty sure that what we were doing was making pretty good sense. Uh, we didn't run her in the little race as much. We only run against the best, and. Um, Sure, we saddled her up because she was a great eater. The one way you could have brought her undone would have been put her in the paddock and let her go to fat and think she's a broodmare. And I think people kid themselves. I think athletes, when they're at their concert pitch stage of their lives, humans and horses, I think should be kept going without busting their bellies on the track and served up where the good races are, chase them all over the countryside and as we're, we're seeing now they chase them overseas too so she would have been competitive anywhere in the world really on a day I'm quite down. sure. Gold edition at the 200 metre mark, look at her go, she opens up three, four, five in front, Industrious getting to second from fun in flight, McFly then satin robes running on but gold edition can't say and she's a brilliant filly, gold edition about six lengths. Flemington has been the scene for so much theatre throughout the history of racing, but it's a boy from a small town, 140 kilometres north of Brisbane, who undoubtedly plays a starring role in the history of the famous course. I started in Gympie the first year and um, had my indentures uh, shifted down to the Gold Coast. Yeah, greatest time of my life really, you know, when you're a young, and young kid and you're learning your trade in Queensland. With more than 60 Group 1 winners on board, Boss ranks as one of the best jockeys to emerge from Queensland. But his career was almost cut short when Glenn broke his neck in a near fatal race fall in Macau in 2002. But with a steely resolve and confidence that's been his trademark throughout his career, Boss was again dreaming about the big ones. I don't think you're worth your salt unless you're dreaming that you can make the big time. Uh, that's why we all do it. We all want to win Melbourne Cups, Cox Plates and... You know, all these races that we watch our heroes as a young boy winning those races. So, yeah, you're not worth your medal unless you think you can get there. Um, obviously a lot don't, um, but I'm just so blessed and privileged that, you know, I was able to be tied up with some great horses and some great horsemen as far as the trainers and, and some great owners that supported me. So they would give me the opportunity to do the things that I've done. In 2003, Boss went on the ride of his life with a horse that went from a champion to a legend in three years. The race that stopped a nation couldn't stop Glenn and Maccabi Diva forging something special. Frightening with Maccabi Diva going for a run. She's finishing hard. And wait around now, Pentastic is joining in. And She's Archie runs on, but Maccabi Diva shot away. She's out by two links to She's Archie. Pentastic and Zagalia. Maccabi Diva in front, she's Archie tries hard but Maccabi Diva wins the cup down the outside is Onazurd and Vinny Rowe is coming home well and further back is Distinction Zasman at the 300 the leader here comes Vinny Rowe, Elstrom coming with him, Maccabi Diva she's got right up on the inside Maccabi Diva she's hit the front now from Vinny Rowe and Zasman, it's Maccabi Diva clear, she's out by two links to Vinny Rowe, it's Maccabi Diva clear and she's going to do what no mare has ever done, Maccabi Diva wins it again. Back behind those horses now as they come down the straight was Vinny Rowe and back behind them here's McKayvey Diva. A nation roars for a hero. She's starting to wind up. 300 left to go now. McKayvey Diva's racing up. Envoy's trying to go with it. They've got the Portland singer and Rockland River. Here comes like a perfect end. Excellent. But McKayvey Diva clear with 100 metres to go. Excellent runs to second. On a zoom runs on. But a champion becomes a legend. McKayvey Diva has won it. Creating history on, on what was a unique individual, Maccabi Diva, she was just um, everything in a horse that you want, tenfold. She was a great partner um, and she just took me to an amazing dizzy heights in my professional career, you know, and it's, it's an experience that um, I'll never get back to. I don't, I don't uh, pretend to go back there again because that, that's something that we'll never see again. Uh, but I'm glad it was a buffet from Queensland that um, got to experience because it's uh, something I'll take to my grave. It is the greatest Melbourne Cup win of all time.
While Boss has lived the high life as one of the world's most sought after jockeys, a growing number of women riders, like Cherie Drake, are doing their part to keep racing alive in Queensland. Drake became Australia's oldest apprentice when she was passed by Queensland Racing Stewards in April 2004. I think they thought a 40-year-old female becoming a, a jockey just didn't sound right to them with two children. And um, the, the other jockeys are sort of retiring at that age, as I was told by the stewards, Darren Biedman was the same age as myself, nearly thinking of retiring. And here I am beginning to start a career. So I think they thought, well, you know, a bit old to be starting a career and can she ride? But with the legendary feats of former top female hoop Pam O'Neill as her inspiration, Drake defied the doubters to forge a successful riding career on tracks across southeast Queensland. Well, she was the first person to assess me when the stewards were a little bit sceptical of me becoming a jockey. And I went out there and she gave me some good, good pointers and helped me get my licence and told the stewards that she thought that I would be able to ride them in races. She's done a tremendous job and with her being able to ride and standing up for herself, she really made the leeway for the girls. As I used to say to the young apprentices, the rewards are there and you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Uh, you've got to really get into it when you can and really make every post a winner because you don't know how long you're going to be in it. Uh, you could have a fall and no jockey ever thinks of, of having that or your weight could become the better of you, so you're not in it for long. And I always encourage apprentices that uh, they've got to have something else to fall back on, you know, because it, it's, it's, it's a hard life. It's not, it's not all glamour like a lot of people think it is. You know, you've really got to knuckle down. If they can ride and they've got the ability, I think that it's a wonderful job and it's got a lot of rewards and uh, you d you've just got to be a little bit tougher, I think, than the average person because you've got to put up with the owners, the trainers, the stewards. It's not just one person and care for yourself. So vital to the industry are female riders that some of the trainers who may have previously hesitated at using the girls' services are now engaging them to ride their horses on a regular basis. I find women are better on the tra tracks and with the horses all the time. Uh, I find them much better and the horses get on better with them. And uh, I, gee, I have a lot of girl riders. When I trained in Sydney, I brought Marie Linden over um, to ride, to replace uh, Shane Dye, who had uh, rode for me for 18 months, and then I replaced him with Marie Linden. And she was a very good rider, but, um, you know, they've uh, really um, put themselves uh, on the map, and I think they'll continue to do so, but because of their weight and dedication in the future. Put simply, according to Courier Mail and Sunday Mail racing editor Bart Sinclair, the game would not survive if it wasn't for the female participation across all levels of racing. I would say now the Australian racing industry would fold as we know it if we didn't have females involved. They, they are the backbone of the industry. Not so much race day and riding, it's, it's good to see that the ones who want to ride can, but what they do seven days a week to, to get horses in a presentable state to race and, and the breeding side of things the, and, and officials, it's, I, I believe Australian racing would certainly be severely diminished if not go close to folding if you didn't have women involved now. But Pam was the flag bearer and she kept knocking on doors, knocking on doors and Gay Waterhouse similarly was just persistence personified. She kept whacking away to get a licence in Sydney but no one did it tougher than Pam and, and she wrote a lot of track work and helped a lot of trainers out to, before she got a licence and then she had to compete without an allowance. So she, she's a great Queensland story. I think it's imperative that the merger must happen. We would like to think that uh, we would have a merged entity uh, by the beginning of the next financial year. I think the sense of doing what we're going to do and, and the benefits it's going to reap for Queensland racing as well as, as Brisbane and Queensland generally will far outweigh the little needles and, and the little upsets that people are going to have in their own personal agendas. In 2009, the power brokers of the two main metropolitan racing clubs finally put to rest their differences and signed a deal that would have the majority of their fallen predecessors turning in their graves. Sir Clive Ewer, in his heyday in the 60s, the 70s, would not have entertained the thought because both clubs were flourishing uh, entities in, in that time. But in this modern era, 
strength comes with unity, financial strength comes with unity, and it's, a, it's something that must happen. Queensland Turf Club had been championing the course for some time, and there'd been, there'd been a fair bit of work done with the Brisbane Turf Club, but they, fair to say, uh, there was probably seen as a bit of a sort of big brother being QTC and little brother being BTC. Uh, the QTC committee were emphatic that it be a merger of equals. Uh, all the documentation that we subsequently, subsequently put together that went to the members of both clubs was titled a, a merger of equals. Uh, the way the whole constitution was structured was that it was a merger of equals. There was to be no you know, adding up of who had what assets and how many members and who had the bigger race course, who was younger, younger, older, any of that. The whole thing for it to work had to be a merger of equals. We uh, managed to get a, a great result of 81.4 per cent. That number's etched in my brain, obviously, when the vote came through. And uh, it's long overdue. And obviously, we've had the support of Eagle Farm as well to, to work through and get this, this merger up and running. Uh, there was an argument around the time that if there was a merger, that sooner or later, Durban, uh, Durban Racecourse would be sold. Uh, what we did was we wrote into the Constitution that for any part of the core racecourse land, at Eagle Farm or Derman to be sold, required 75% plus one of every single member entitled to vote. Uh, you know, we only get sort of about you know, 50, 60% people voting at the best of times, so it's nearly an impossible, impossible task. After years of bickering, the Queensland Turf Club and the Brisbane Turf Club ended a proposal that had started in 2004 by merging to become the Brisbane Racing Club. With the club suffering financially to record the same figures they had years earlier, it was deemed the only way forward was to merge, and Brisbane owner and businessman Kevin Dixon was named the inaugural chairman of the New Look BRC. After years of speculation, finally a plan. Both racetracks remain Eagle Farm and Doombin, but they'll be almost unrecognisable. Other sports realised some time ago that they needed to be entertainment venues. The historic parts of Eagle Farm will be retained and turned into shops and cafes. A new grandstand will be built and a hotel looking over the home straight. 1,600 parking spaces will be created. 13 hectares of vacant land will become housing. Just don't ask how many apartments. Those details are still being worked out. Race organisers say new facilities so close to the airport will attract a higher standard of racing. Well, uh, we're aiming for the Melbourne Cup. With a combined membership, um, the members now have an opportunity to attend far more race meetings. For example, uh, any cultural divide that may have existed over time will be broken down if it hasn't already been broken down right now. And, and moreover, from a financial standpoint, <clears throat> there are a number of opportunities for the single administration now to consolidate a whole range of activities across the, across the two venues. Fantastic for racing here in Queensland because as much as they had the history was right, it was time to have one club and the Merge Club, I see some exciting times ahead. I believe there should be two race courses here in Brisbane. I think we're very fortunate <coughs> excuse me, to have these facilities so close to uh, the CBD and um, I think the next decade in Queensland racing is really exciting. The development plans that the Brisbane Racing Club have in place, and sure that's going to take a long time and you and I may not see the ultimate result, but it's going to start. And the, the infrastructure of the racetrack and the facilities for racegoer is a priority. So we will see that. And then on it goes with commercial development after that. That will generate a lot of turnover for the Brisbane Racing Club. I think it's the most innovative uh, master plan for a race course in the country, if not in the world. I mean, some of the innovation includes stabling in the middle. One of, uh, for horses, we'll have about 450 horses stabled in the middle of the race course. Uh, you know, everyone said it couldn't be done, but this winter carnival, we've had Gay Waterhouse from Ramwick and Danny O'Brien from Flemington stabled in the middle. Gay says it's you know the most fantastic place she she stabled a horse. He said it's like living in the living in the country. So we've been able to prove things like that where everyone said it couldn't be done. Well, in Queensland, it can be done. We would expect the, the plan and the delivery of that plan to be well managed. There's no question that Queensland Racing will be consulted along the way. But um, if there's one thing that people in the Queensland racing industry have been without uh, for a long period of time but do deserve is a first class facility. No question about that at all. In August 2007, on an otherwise unremarkable day, industry participants across the nation were going through their pre-race routines when a news story broke that would forever change the national racing industry. 
South East Queensland Racing is in lockdown. Racing and training suspended until February at Doombin, Eagle Farm and Albion Park. The Gold and Sunshine Coast tracks Toowoomba and Ipswich also closed. Oh, it's an absolute disaster. It's, uh, it's the worst possible thing that could have happened to us. This undoubtedly is Queensland Racing's darkest hour. There is no racing this afternoon. The program has been cancelled. I don't think we really understood um, where we were going to finish at that time. We certainly understood the virus to an extent, um, but not how virulent the virus was going to be in terms of it spreading very quickly. At various times, it uh, throughout the entire crisis, it shut us down. And um, whilst there were a number of people involved that were impacted, uh, including those people that have their ponies and, uh, and, and their pleasure horses, the industry of racing was crippled at various times. And we spoke at length to the government, uh, pointing out the contribution that we make annually. And uh, back then it was in, in the order of $700 million to the gross state spend, the, the gross domestic product. Uh, we employed at the time something like 25 or 26,000 people in either full-time, part-time or casual positions. And certainly in South East Queensland, the activity ground to a halt. Non-racing people were so adversely affected in that you, know, you had, well, the Courier Mail ran a page one picture and we had a, a bookmaker's clerk, we had a, a gatekeeper, we had a kitchen staff person. We had 16 or 17 people whose livelihood was affected by EI. And the government recognised that by saying, well, this has had a, a big dent on the economy and the state government put in some money as well. So it, the, the money softened the blow, but emotionally it was very difficult for everyone. We had people that uh, were required to transform overnight. Um, people out in the field that weren't necessarily qualified horse people, um, chasing horses in paddocks, uh, cat catching horses in paddocks so they could be inoculated. So very quickly the structure of our organisation changed. In fact, it, it changed overnight. Um, it's very dynamic. The, f the first weekend, for example, when we were able to finally vaccinate or inoculate horses, uh, over the Saturday and Sunday, we had inoculated in the order of 5,500 horses. Inside, the light is on, they're ready to go. Been a great day's racing here at Athens, they're off. Oh, she Suprema stood there and missed it about 10 lengths. Canadian Crystal dropped out to the rear very quickly and Cheyenne Kid began fast. Following the division the of the state into two colours, two zones, a, a, a northern and a southern, because we could um, race in northern and, and northwestern parts of Queensland, we quickly had a look at what TAB product we could get out of that part of the state. Um, I think always thinking of the mighty dollar. And uh, needless to say, we had a number of race meetings out there in Queensland run at the TAB level at venues that had uh, never thought of conducting a, a TAB race meeting. So there were some positives even in the darkest moments of, uh, of the crisis. I had the opportunity of going to charter at a Mount Isa to call races. And those guys out there just thought it was wonderful that they were getting coverage uh, throughout Australia. Straightening up now, 400 metres to go. Samurai Spirit is the leader. Samurai Spirit shows the way. Karayas didn't handle the bend all that well. Coming to the outside is Pitta Patty. Zoe's lad is giving them a mild start, but he's starting to put in a run down the outside. Samurai Spirit, he's kicked away from the 150 metres to go. Samurai Spirit about two in front of Karayas and then Pitta Patty on the outside. Zoe's lad, but they knew what they were doing. They put it on and they're going to collect as well. I couldn't believe the, the amount of money that was held on the TABs on some of these Mount Isa race meetings. But they presented well, they raced well, the horses, the horses here raced to form, they, they're dirt track horses, they raced to form and, and uh, we were glad to be able to do something. You know, they were averaging holding between two and a half and to two point eight million dollars a day on, on Mount Isa racing on Tuesdays and Thursdays or wherever, wherever they had them. So it was good, it was good for the owners to have something to go on with, good for the trainers to keep going. It was a good bit of publicity. It exposed country racing to metropolitan racing in a very, very stylish fashion. And they were so proud that they could help out in a tough time. And you meet some wonderful characters out there, Charleville and they wouldn't dare let you go home after the races. You had to go down to the pub and have a few beers with them.
Like fine cotton, the mention of equine influenza has the entire racing industry in cold sweats. And although the memories of what happened during racing's darkest period in 2008 will never be erased, there were some positives to emerge. Whopper Stevens, the unofficial Lord Mayor of Deakin, could not believe his luck when Queensland racing officials announced racing would return to his beloved track for a one-off meeting during the EI outbreak. So much of Whopper's extraordinary life had been played out at Deegan, and the cunning old fox had yet another trick up his sleeve, the day racing returned to Deegan for the first time in nearly 70 years. Golden Shinto, a horse Whopper owned and trained, but had almost been condemned to retirement through injury, found his best form and won the first race of that historic meeting. I bought him myself too. We owned him ourselves. And uh, he was a pretty smart horse, and, uh, but he had a bow tendered. He got a bow tendered. And I saw well, he's finished. At the 700 metres mark, and it's Golden Chinto on the inside, Flash of Silk in the middle. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, they put on a meeting here. Anyway, I wasn't able to start him, I said, oh, you know, he's not that bad. <laughs> so I brought him over and I started him, and he won. Well, I thought he'd win too, because he's pretty free three. He run favourite, a second favourite direction. Golden Shinto first around the turn at the 250. Emotions coming deep and then flash of silk and Divinity Dash is getting off the fence. Well, the train the first one, especially you own it yourself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you own the horse yourself and you break them in and bring them up. And to, for a race meet to be put on out of the blue at a place where you grew up with, and to win the first race, it was a pretty good achievement, I thought. Golden Shido, Divinity Dash and Roswell. Golden Shido and Divinity Dash and the inside I think maybe Golden Shido over Divinity Dash and Roswell. Bruce McLaughlin's on a roll of top line horses could have easily been mistaken for the who's who of Queensland racing. His stable was never devoid of a great horse and gallopers like Planet Ruler, St Jude, Al Mansour, with me, Sublimate and Our Fiction helped load his mantelpiece with trophies of 17 Group 1 wins. But although he had savoured success in some of Australia's most prestigious classics, McLaughlin had always harboured a dream to win the world's richest juvenile event, and as fate would have it, his dream came true in 2009. The group of three of us bought that horse uh, at, a, uh, at the Magic Millions yearling sale, and uh, uh, Bruce was really, really wrapped in the horse from day one. But uh, and it, uh, at at a stage, it had uh, ran three ra had run three races and hadn't hadn't won a race. But he always said that that horse was going to be as good as any horse he's ever had, and to an extent where he had 45 yearlings that year, it was the only one he nominated for the Golden Slipper. He often come back on the partnership, which I appreciate very much because you know he um, I was looking at a change, probably from Ramwick because. Sydney probably wasn't, living in Sydney wasn't really my cup of tea, but um, he invited me back and um, timing's everything in life and come back and within a few months he won the Magic Millions and back up and won a Golden Slipper and you know, it wasn't not a bad year. Coming to the 200 and Paprika went to the lead, Motown Ladies getting up on the fence and feeling ready, he's coming late, Paprika the leader, feeling ready and Motown Lady, the three of them are coming to the line and feeling ready. Bill and Reddy got up and won the millions. Always showed us a ton of potential, this horse. And he just rode him like George Moore, but it's great. Now he's promised the world this horse and he's finally delivered. You got no really talk about this horse prior to the race. Were you disappointed by that? It was actually good. I, you wouldn't believe what I said to the staff and Dad during the week. We're going to go into the race. We're going into this race as an underdog and we've got no pressure on us. And Jason rode the horse, just rode him quiet and he really found the line. The horse stood up today. Jason just told us he had a lot of trust in this horse. Jason's taken over, you better go and see him. No, we've spoken to him, we want to get you. No, no, we're very happy with it, mate. It was tremendous, it was. And, uh, you know, I thought probably it might have been a bit short for him. And I said to Larry, we're talking about him, make a lovely size horse. Well, here he is today winning the Magic Millions. We honestly gave it a good show. And, and, but we, we, we couldn't believe that it was 71 to 1. And, and it, it won like a, like a 7 to 1 on shot chance. Uh, but uh, then from there on in, it went down to the slipper and 
no one gave it a chance again. Then came Indian Ocean on the inside, followed further back behind them by Manhattan Rain and Melito. Real Sagas trying to go up along the inside, but it's still a mile back. Reward for effort took over now from uh, in second spot, more joyous. And then we've got Feeling Ready who's coming right through along the inside. Feeling Ready has gone through and now some sweepers are coming wide headway in Manhattan Rain, but it's Feeling Ready. Feeling Ready's got the slipper at his mercy and Feeling Ready won it. Photo second and third Manhattan Rain. Grabbed to Willa. He's now the Amy Golden Slipper winner in 2009. Bruce McLaughlin and Jason McLaughlin. Well, congratulations. Father and son combination. Bruce has trained a lot of good winners, Caroline. This would be more special than anyone previously because alongside his name stands his son, Jason McLaughlin. In the eight months before he passed away in June this year, Bruce and Jason had racked up well over 50 winners, but the slipper win undoubtedly was the big bloke's most satisfying moment in a sterling career. To see him that day with his son, where they'd formed that partnership, winning the Magic Millions, and then of course the Golden Slipper, that just completed a wonderful career. And for him, um, a great bloke Bruce, and um, his ideas and thoughts in racing, they were listened to by those that run committees and run um, uh, the uh, Queensland racing and that. He was, uh, he had a lot of foresight and he had a lot of quality to go with it. Apart from his, uh, you know, racing record, his premierships and his group one wins and the great horses that he trained, um, he, was a, he was a great guy. He had a lot of knowledge of a lot of things, loved his boxing, he was a great boxing fanatic and he was a gardener. Uh, he'd rather talk sometimes about plants than horses. The year we had training together, well, we won a Magic Millions, a Golden Slipper. We won about 70 other races together. We had an amazing 10 months it was, but we had good times too because he, I think he was, uh, you know, he just, I, I think I really got to know the man. He was going to wind down a bit, you know, bring Jay back and, and get things going, which they went from strength to strength together. And um, he was going to wind down and we were going to sort of, um, just have a nice holiday together overseas and and um, that was not to be. At a time when racing stables are frantic, McLaughlin Place was eerily quiet. Tears were shared. He's uh, an inductee into the Hall of Fame in Queensland. Um, yeah, he's just an absolute legend. We've lost a great man, we've lost a great racehorse trainer and I think we've, we've lost a great Queenslander. I'll be talking about him in a hundred years for his achievements. I've got to keep it going, that's what Dad wanted, that's what he... All these years we worked together to, you know, I've got to keep the place going. That's, my, that's his passion and my passion. With the support of Jason and all the staff and the owners, we will keep his dream alive. Thank you. Passing of Bruce has left a void in a lot of our lives, really, uh, and it was a it was a terrible shock. I was, I, was pe I was speaking to him the night before he died, at seven o'clock that night, and he was he was he, he sounded a bit weak, but he was talking about what he was going to do tomorrow. And when I got the phone call at five o'clock the next morning, I couldn't believe it. It's funny, I was talking to a couple of trainers in Melbourne the other day, and they all admired Dad because he was one of those, he was a Queensland trainer and he always travelled his horses and everybody knew him and Dad wasn't frightened to take on anyone's horses. And um, over the years, you know, you talk about good horses from Queensland, just as a lot of me trained. The journey sadly has ended for one of Queensland's greatest ever trainers and all-round good blokes. But another journey has begun for around 8,000 people as they trek to Birdsville and the event they call the Melbourne Cup of the Bush, where names like Prow, Ballard and Austin are as respected as Atkins, Dittman and Heathcote. <laughs> Sixteen hundred kilometres west of Brisbane and eleven hundred kilometres north of Adelaide lies a racetrack that once a year hosts what the locals call the Melbourne Cup of the Bush. For two days, this dusty, desolate patch of dirt transforms into a rural racing mecca, a vibrant carnival that attracts a crowd of die-hard punters. It may not be the race that stops a nation, but it's one that ignites a town.
by coming here, you're meeting everybody on equal terms because there's no horses trained here, you know. Where if someone is trained, if they race there every month and some blokes are trained here, their horse would definitely go better than, than us blokes who've got to travel a thousand kilometres, you know, because they're on the track and know the track and where these horses have got to come, they get a bit tired travelling, but they all got to do it mostly. Yeah, they all got to come at least seven or eight hundred K or better. Charlie Prow and his team have made this gruelling trip for more than 25 years. His team of horses includes the 2008 winner Evading, back for another crack at the cup. Charlie is somewhat of a star in these parts. His status as a trainer on the country race circuit has earned comparisons to another legendary Cups king. I'll take that heavy rug off him, Jeep. I've never been to a place where somebody hasn't heard of him or knows what he's done. Yeah, he's, he's a bad coming to, of the bush, easy. Without a doubt, yeah. Have a good trip to Burrsville. Yep. Now get mixed up with the Burrsville dust. And I think we'll bring the cup back on Monday. Good boy. See ya. It's an arduous trip for both humans and horses, and a lot can go wrong before they even set foot on the track. Halfway to Birdsville, the town of Jundar provides welcome relief from the endless road and the chance to stop for the night and check the horses. One of the horses has suffered minor abrasions during the trip and needs tending to. Charlie calls on Davy Rewald, who is not only a jockey who'll ride the cup favourite, but also the truck driver, vet and everything else that needs doing along the way. Yeah, well I've been brought up with horses and that, and, um, that you know, I'll pat, pat, patch them up, you know. Um, Hopefully they don't hurt themselves, but yeah, I've done a, I've done a bit of everything. They're back on the road at dawn for the last 700 k's into Birdsville. Like Priscilla before them, these fillies and mares are quickly learning there's nothing glamorous about being queens of the desert. At Birdsville, the transformation is already taking place. Overnight, the town swelled from 100 locals to almost 10,000 visitors. Accommodation is scarce and tent cities spring up everywhere, flanked by caravans and campers fitted out with all the mod cons. When I first came here, caravans weren't coming here like they are now. The roads wasn't as good. You know, you'd be very, uh, you know, very unusual to see a caravan. They'd, they'd have utes and that sort of thing. And, Carps and that all over them, that, but you wouldn't see them pulling these big flash caravans like they are now, and, and, and nice cars, you know. They had some just four wheel drive, probably a little truck thing that they'd have a big load on, three or four people, but the, now they're just pulling these good caravans, good cars, and all. Yeah. But they're all here for one thing the racing. And as the heat rises on Friday, so does the excitement on track. And the punters don't miss out on any of the Cups' traditions. It is like the Melbourne Cup, everyone's heard of it, you know what I mean? Um, you win a Mount Isa Cup or Emerald Cup, you know, you're talking to someone at a pub and they go, where's that, you know? They don't even know where Birdsville is, but they've heard of a Birdsville Cup. It's the top of the tree, and that's what we all aim for. We, we try to try to win that. Uh, you know, there's a lovely curious race there that's that's worth a bit of money. We've got the, uh, uh, the sprints on both days. They're, they're nice, healthy races. They've done a big job here. The overall prize money at about 30,000 is very good for an outback meeting. I'm not sure that there'd be any better in Australia. Maybe there is in uh, one of the bigger mining towns, something like that. But as far as the real bush outback, it's pretty good. And it's backed up by another 12 races. Um, we've had good sponsors. We're, we're, well, we're well sponsored. A near record crowd rolls in with long lines stretching out from the food and drink vans. The event grows more popular every year, but there's a limit to how many people this racing oasis can cater for. We've had to uh, limit the potential growth, and it could be bigger for sure. We are surrounded by dirt roads. There's a, there's a lot of uh, question marks about uh, getting people here, getting supplies here, getting people in and out. And uh, uh, whilst it would be good to have a really bumper crowd, uh, it could also be a bumper disaster if, uh, if things went wrong. Cup day and Charlie and jockey Dave Rewald discuss a few last minute tactics. All eyes are on the mounting guard as the horses head off to the barrier and the crowd jostles for a vantage point along the fence to witness the running of the 2009 Birdsville Cup. 
The horses round the corner in a cloud of red dust. Charlie's Mount Royal Chariot drifts back in the field as Mount Isa jockey Keith Ballard takes Equiton to the lead. Richard told me to get, get cover and wait all day. And when you see the, the top weight getting away and getting away and you just got to count to ten and wait and wait and wait. But I was pretty happy when I went for him, he just kept giving me an enormous feeling. Keith Ballard wins his first Birdsville Cup for owner trainer Richard Simpson, who also trained the 2002 winner, Boyerin. It was Equiton's third start on the dirt track, the $17,800 winner's check, taking his career earnings past the $100,000 mark. Post-race, back at the campsite, and as Charlie puts the horses to bed, he is philosophical about a weekend of lost chances. You get a bit disappointed when you've come and uh, haven't done any good, but you're still... Tomorrow's a new day. I've had that plenty of times. Anyone in racing or any sport, you can't win all the time, can you? As the sun sets over Birdsville, the stories come out. People swap tales of the one that should have won. And over a few beers, plans are hatched to come back again next year. And there you have it. The often remarkable, sometimes sad, but always inspiring highs and lows of the greatest sport of all in Queensland. Rest assured, there'll be many more champion trainers, jockeys and horses emerge from the hallowed grounds of Eagle Farm and Doombin. And the legendary tracks like Mount Isa and Birdsville. And the adoring fans will come to cheer them as well. The new order of the Brisbane Racing Club now has grand plans to take racing in this city to the world, and so they should. But no one can erase the past and the achievements of our predecessors, who, against all odds, made racing in the Sunshine State what it is today. Racing, and Puffin began fairly well, and they as did uh, Rep Shot. Burnborough dropping in into about fourth place after the start. As they come towards the two furlongs the first time round, the leader is Fox Breeze on the outside from Puffham, then Wellesley, Repshot, followed by T-Cake, Burnborough, Wiseland, I Will, Craigie next, and last of all is Blueness. Approaching the judges' box the first time round with about nine to go, and Fox Breeze is four lengths in front of Puffham, two lengths to Repshot, a half to Wellesley, two lengths to T-Cake, I Will, a half a length in front of Burnborough on the inside, three lengths to Craigie, two lengths to Wiseland, and last of all is Blueness. With a mile to go and the pace is fairly fast, Box Breeze well clear. Six lengths in front of Puffham, a length and a half to Repshot sticking to the inside, a length further back as well as Lee, then Burnborough, a half a length to TK and I will, four lengths to Craigie, two and a half lengths to Blueness, and last of all is Wise Land. Up towards about six and a half to go and Fox Breeze still six lengths in front of Puffham, a length and a half to Repshot holding his ground well. Four lengths to Wellesley, then comes Tea Cake, a length to Burnborough. Mully hasn't yet moved on Burnborough yet. A length in front of I Will, three lengths to Craigie, four lengths to Blurness, and Wise Land still last. About five four lengths to go and Fox Breeze, four lengths in front of Puffham, a length and a half further back is Repshot. Two lengths to Tea Cake and Wellesley, a length and a half to Burnborough. Two lengths to Craigie, who's going up there smartly, then I Will, four lengths to Blurness, and last of all is Wise Land. Half a mile to go and Fox Breeze coming back to his feet, leading a length and a half to Puffham, a length further back is Repshot. Two lengths to Wellesley, a half farther back is Burnborough on the inside moving up. Uh, Burnborough just lost a bit of ground there. Then comes TK, a length farther back is Craigie, then I will. With three furlongs to go, Puffham leads from uh, Repshot. Got a beautiful run through on the inside and has joined Puffham in the lead. And Repshot uh, with two furlongs to go is just about Puffham. Three lengths farther back is Fox Breeze. Then on the inside is TK, followed by Burnborough on the outside. With a furlong and a half to go, the leader is Repshot, leading a length farther back is Puffham. Uh, two lengths further back is Craigie, followed by Burnborough, who is uh, coming home fairly well now with a furlong to go. Repshot leads by about a length from Burnborough from the crowd. He's coming like a tornado. And Burnborough's got his head in front of tea cake. Burnborough's playing by all oh, this mighty horse is going to win it well. And Burnborough goes on and wins it from tea cake. Third is Craigie, the next is Repshot, followed by Puffham. And Wellesley, Blueness, Fox, Breeze and I will, and last of all was Wiseland.